I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, um, uh, Fritz Bittenbender. He's the Vice President for Bio uh, Alliance Development State Government Relations. And actually, this is his first time in Wisconsin, so um, it's great to have him here and have him ha have Bio Forward host him. And um, he's got some really great information to talk to you about. So please welcome Fritz Bittenbender. <laughs> I think I have everything I need here. The mic's working, everyone hear me? Great, well thank you uh, for hosting me in Wisconsin. I must say I'm a little trepidatious about this because it's my first trip to Wisconsin and Brian asked me to come talk a little about what's going on in Washington and I feel a little like Scrooge because uh, the f talking about the fiscal cliff is not a good way to be invited back as a speaker anytime um, soon. Um, but uh, we'll try and uh, intersperse some of the things that are going on in Washington with some of the positive things that are also going on around the country. Um, but I want to start by um, thanking Brian and everything the association does. Uh, one of the jobs that I get to do is I, I'm executive director of something called the Council of State Biotech Associations. And we're an organization of 51 state bioscience associations in 47 states around the country. And part of my job is to fly around the country making sure that those associations are um, have the assistance they need and that bio as a national organization is helping out in any way we can. And so I get to see a lot of associations from ones that have part-time executive directors to uh, ones like Massachusetts that probably have 30 staff. Um, but I can tell you that amongst his peers, Brian and everything that's going on with BioForward is, is recognized as one of the top associations in, in the country for everything that you do. So I was very pleased when I got the invitation to come and speak here because uh, it's nice to be associated with such a fine organization. All right, so that being said, just a little uh, uh, information about uh, bio. We're uh, the national organization for the biopharmaceutical industry. We represent about 1,200, 11, 1,200 companies around the country and some internationally. Um, our area of focus is broken into three primary areas, healthcare, agricultural, and industrial and environmental. Um, we work on policy issues um, across all three of those, um, those uh, critical areas and have a staff of about, I guess, 120 people in Washington around the country that do that. Um, so because we're in the holiday season and because I want to talk about good things as well as what's going on in Washington, um, I've decided to title my presentation um, The Naughty and Nice List um, because there's definitely some things that are going on right now that could have a tremendous negative impact on our industry, but there's also some wonderful things going on for our industry right now, and I'd like to uh, focus on, on some of those positive things as well. So on the naughty and nice list, I think from a positive perspective, bioscience employment is steady, and the perceptions of our industry are overwhelmingly positive, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, I think all of us know, um, you more than probably anybody else, because you've been through a year and a half of constant uh, commercials on TV and constant election cycles that um, you know, the fiscal situation for the public and private sector is ominous, and we certainly have a divided electorate right now. And um, despite, I think, a significant victory for the presidents, it was a status quo election um, with the president winning, um, the Senate picking up a couple seats, uh, Democrats and the House retain Republicans retaining control of the House and just losing a couple seats. And because of that, we can see a lot of the conversation going on in Washington right now. We don't really have yet a sustainable path forward, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So the NICE, the bioscience employment is, uh, is steady and perception industry are positive. Um, one of the things that bio does every two or three years is we do a, uh, a national jobs report that talks about and looks at what's going on in the industry around the country and then in specific states. And uh, frankly, um, we did one, we announced it at our bioannual meeting in Chicago this year. And as we went into it, we were a little trepidatious because um, we hadn't done one in three years and there had been a significant recession um, in the middle of the time that we had done the last one and uh, started to grow coming out of that. And we weren't really sure what we were going to find. A lot of the national news headlines talked about how Big Pharma was laying off people all over the country and you know, a lot of layoffs in the industry. So um, we weren't sure when we started looking at this what we were going to find. And so we decided to break this up into um, two distinct um, time frames in order to hit the problem uh, straight on. We divided it up into a 10-year time horizon and then a very specific four-year time horizon from 2007 to 2011 so we could look at the impact of the recession into the beginning of the recovery on the numbers. And what we found was very interesting. Um, what we found is that over a 10-year period of time, bioscience 
uh, employment in the country has actually grown pretty substantially. We had a growth of uh, almost 7% um, over a 10-year period of time at a time when private sector jobs were declining over the, around the country uh, at almost 2.9%. Uh, so a very big spread in terms of growth of our industry versus what was happening there over all private sector. And then Wisconsin uh, has a very positive trend. Um, as you can see, a, a huge divergence, and the growth in uh, Wisconsin has been um, very, very positive. Um, and uh, some of, the, I think, the key points, particularly throughout that recession period of time, is that Wisconsin um, began to really pick up job growth during a downtime in the economy, with an 8% growth in medical device and diagnostic companies, a 13% growth in drugs and pharma, an 18% growth in research and testing, which is generally your smaller companies and probably some of the great things that are going on in this building. And then there's been a slight decline in the distribution of IAG Biotech here. So overall, um, I think you can see you have, you have a very balanced life science portfolio in Wisconsin, um, which uh, a lot of other states in the country would certainly envy, um, with a balance between um, uh, distribution, uh, medical device, and then pharmaceuticals. As you can see, um, you know, significant employment, and we add up the sort of the multiplier effect to that employment, almost 100,000 jobs here um, directly tied to the industry. And, and the wages are, are very substantial, very good paying jobs. So um, this is a very positive thing. And like I said, I go around the country, and a lot of places in the country don't have this distribution. They certainly don't have um, that trend. So it's something I think Wisconsin should be very proud of. And one of the things that you know, is wonderful about our industry is also we still enjoy a very positive public perception. So I think the job growth helps that. But the things we're doing for people, you know, a lot of people have dubbed this the biotech century. And when you look at how um, medical innovation um, and industrial environmental and food and agriculture all combine, they touch almost every aspect of our life now. And it's um, most times in a very positive way. As you can see, um, on the health side, which is uh, where bio focuses most of our energy. Um, you know, we have 260 approved medicines that are biologics. Um, some of the most significant uh, medicines right now um, in the innovator side of the space are biologics. And one of the interesting facts, despite the industry is only 35 years old, um, almost 50% of the medicines now under review at the FDA are biologic medicines. So the science has made um, tremendous advancements in just 30 years. And it's being recognized. Um, one of the things Bio did um, about 18 months ago is we hired Frank Luntz, who's a well-known political pollster. We wanted to, to try and dig into how we should be talking about our industry, as well as what the general public and opinion elites felt about our industry, and trying to come up with some language of how to better talk about the industry at backyard barbecues and, and how we can really focus uh, our message on what's important to people in the biotechnology, because the space can actually be um, uh, sometimes confusing for people. And one of the interesting things we found out of this, which is why it's certainly on our nice list, is that uh, biotechnology, um, as opposed to uh, you know, most of the other healthcare industries, and also the medical device industry, but they have very strong public opinion um, numbers, and uh, both amongst the general population and also amongst opinion elites. And the interesting thing is, despite a lot of our membership being pharmaceutical companies and small pharma, um, when you compare that to sort of the big uh, pharmaceutical mantra, Obviously, biotech still enjoys a very positive public perception vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, the rest of the industry. Um, one of the things we found is that people really resonate to biotech is that we're searching for innovative medicines that are actually cures for patients. So a lot of the biotech products you see in development right now are actually targeted at rare and orphan diseases for which there is no medicine right now. And a lot of them are targeted at cures or significant life improvements for the patient. So um, you know, one of the things we found in our messaging is when you talk about cures, people really respond. And uh, for Jordan and the people who are working on policy, this is something interesting for policymakers because they really respond to this kind of language. And as you can see, you know, sometimes we talk about drugs or therapies. Um, that is not very responsive language. Um, so one of the things that bio is going to be doing, and hopefully by this summer you'll all have this, is we're going to be putting together a package around this that will be a, you know, a couple slide presentation around how to talk about our industry and particularly for our state affiliates, you know, how to go in and talk to policymakers using this kind of data. And again, it's about curing disease. People are very interested in the innovative breakthroughs, but particularly interested in that, in those cures. So sort of uh, culminating our nice list, you know, I think the industry changing and the future is about discovering development partnerships. I, we see this in this building. I mean, I, I'm just overwhelmed when I pulled in here today 
what a tremendous research it is. And you know, it's the research that's going to be going on in this building and the partnerships with the state and the university, which really big pharma and a lot of our bigger biotech companies are really coveting right now as they become big marketing machines and really look to some of the smaller companies and universities to engage in some of the early stage research. So again, partnerships with universities are going to be critical. Um, and emerging companies are going to be critical to larger company success. You know, entrepreneurial strategies, you know, investing in entrepreneurs and getting them to start these companies with uh, their cutting edge science is, is what uh, is going to be very important for our industry. And obviously, your strategy fits very nicely into that, into that uh, strategy as well. BioForward has a very aggressive legislative strategy. Um, you know, um, Brian and Jordan and I were talking a little bit about um, your policy. Hopefully, it's going to be in this year's budget. Um, for um, you know, 150 to 200 million dollars to support um, early stage um, venture capital and early stage research in the state, and that is critical. And it's probably one of the, the most significant investments that's going on right now in the country if that gets passed. And I think you'll see companies and researchers and entrepreneurs really value that and flock to Wisconsin because of that. So that adds you an extra gold star on the nice list for today. <coughs> So some of the other things that are going on, however, that sort of balance out all those things on the nice list. Um, you know, our fiscal situation, as we talked about, is ominous. Um, Congress has it figures out how to deal with this. I was going to be looking for significant pay-fors, and a lot of those are going to come from, you know, our industry, or they're going to try to find them from our industry. And then things like uh, pharmaceuticals and environment and drug take-back programs and ongoing, um, you know, GMO fights that we're fighting on, on labeling issues. There's you know, our industry has a lot of, uh, a lot of issues of contention that, that we're working on, so public policy is really um, critical to us at both at the federal and the state level right now. Um, so to talk a little bit um, about what's going on fiscally and where I think from a biotech perspective and medical device perspective and industry perspective as a whole we're going to end up. Um, you know, I think the fiscal cliff and the whole situation we're facing can pretty much be summed up by this slide. Um, unless one is colorblind, I think you can instantly tell um, what the problem is, and that's that uh, our revenues are not uh, uh, keeping up space, uh, pace with our expenditures. And you know, when I'm not an economist, but I've heard a lot of people talk about this, and you see that sort of red line there, I think is um, you know, the baseline. But you know, a federal government can have uh, a run a slight deficit as long as there's significant GDP growth that helps you know, overcome uh, the results of that deficit. But what we've been seeing is increased spending that's totally outpacing GDP in this country. And that's why you see that wide divergent we're having with the lines. And we have to get both our GDP growing and uh, our revenues back in line with our expenditures, or our expenditures back in line with our revenues, depending on uh, which side of the issue you're, uh, you're on. Um, one of the interesting things about this um, is, uh, and this is just a, a cartoon, uh, we've met the enemy and he is us. You know, one of the biggest problems with our budget is this, and that's that you know, Medicare is driving a substantial proportion um, of the budget increases that we're facing, and that's natural because the baby boomers are coming along and more and more people are coming into the Medicare program. Um, costs continue to go up. So when you look at sort of that part of the budget that uh, is very substantial and grows, um, these are some of the biggest pots uh, of the budget that, that are growing, Medicare being the biggest one of them. Um, what's interesting, and I, people don't generally recognize this, and I had a slide I should have put in, but when you look at the whole federal government budget, only about 18% of it is discretionary. So these things are not deemed to be discretionary items because they're created by federal law and they're not changed annually by the budget. Um, the only way you change these programs is to go into the law that created them and change the law. Um, so they're not changed by the, the president's budget every year. But only about 18% of the president's budget is discretionary now. So there's not when you talk about the big fiscal gap that we have, you know, you can almost eliminate most of the discretionary programs and you don't totally close that gap. Um, so it's changes to these non-discretionary programs and the increase in them that's really causing a lot of the problem in Washington. So that brings us to sort of where we are today. We have a convergence of issues happening in Washington that probably we have not seen. I haven't seen it in my lifetime. And I'm sure most of you have not seen it in your lifetime e either. Um, with the expiration of tax cuts and payroll cuts and unemployment insurance benefits, um, with the expiration of the DOC fix, um, I don't know if there are any physicians here, but as you know, as part of the Medicaid, Medicare Modernization Act a while ago, they um, put forced um, decreases in, in Medicare payments to physicians, um, which um, the, the 
Congress never really wanted to see enacted, so every year they have to go in the budget and change those, and if they don't change them now, there's going to be an automatic 27 percent decrease in payments to physicians who care for Medicare patients across the board. And that's just, that, that would fundamentally stop physicians from wanting uh, or be able to financially care for Medicare patients, so it's a tremendous issue. Um, and obviously, you know, everyone's heard about this, but one of the re ways that Congress um, and its wisdom decided to deal with this issue was not to deal with it and um, to have an automatic sequestration if they couldn't come up with about $1.2 trillion in budget cuts. And basically what sequestration means is that at the end of the year, if they haven't come up with those budget cuts, it'll just be, um, you know, half of those cuts are going to come from defense and then half are going to come from a lot of the other discretionary spending that we talked about. Um, so it was a way that Congress, you know, they thought would force themselves to make a deal, but it turns out that that may not have been the case. So um, those cuts will automatically go um, January 1st into, um, um, in, into the budget. And on top of all this, um, we're also by February going to need an increase, uh, a, a congressional approved increase in our debt ceiling, um, which um, uh, is, is sort of driving a lot of the discussions we're having right now. So in total, if you think about it in a big, big circle, for next year, it's about $720 billion of stuff that they have to come up with in order to stop a lot of these things from happening. And that's just for one year. Um, you know, I think we talked a lot about a lot of these slides. Um, uh, it sort of details more of what some of these cuts are, including you know, the tax cuts that are expiring, the automatic spending cuts, payroll taxes, and um, you know, once you get over couple hundred billion dollars, it gets to be real money. So what are we looking at near term because of this and what's keeping us at night over bio is we look at sort of that financial picture and we try and figure out where we can have an impact as an advocacy organization. Um, you know, first of all, sequestration is, is important to us um, because there are things that will get sequestered which will have a very negative impact on our industry if that happens. Um, one of the things that CBO uh, determined and we're still fighting with them is that uh, PDUFA funds would be sequestered. And as, as many of you know, um, we actually, uh, pharmaceutical companies pay the FDA to review um, the approval of their products. Um, and they do that under the PDUFA uh, Prescription Drug User Fee Act. Um, we just uh, negotiated the fifth PDU Prescription Drug User Fee Act this year. And tremendous breakthroughs in that act, which we think are very positive for accelerating innovation and getting products to patients much more quickly. Um, and our fear is that if uh, PDUFA funds get sequestered, that um, a lot of the things that are in PDUFA 5 will not be able to be implemented because there won't be the funding for the positions or, or the expenditures that are needed to uh, bring an accelerate approval pathway or a breakthrough approval pathway to the market um, or some of the other things that were very critical in that. So um, we're watching sequestration um, very um, importantly. Um, the other thing about sequestration, and for many smaller companies in here or research institutions, there's an across the board significant cut to NIH, which could be 8 to 10 percent um, if that happens. And that um, would mean a lot of discretionary funding at NIH to give grants to, um, to early stage research and early stage companies will, will be cut from the NIH budget. You know, some of the other things that we're, uh, we're watching, and particularly as what we call in the industry pay fors, as Congress looks to pay for things, um, we're looking for changes to the Medicare Part D program. For our industry, the Medicare Part D program has been very valuable. It also has for senior citizens. It's probably one of the only programs that the federal government has created that has uh, enrolled more people than they said it would, and it's costing less than they said it would, and it's providing uh, important medicines um, that had not theretofore been provided um, to seniors. So this is a tremendous program, but um, you know, we're looking to make sure that Congress doesn't make changes that could gut that program. From a biologics perspective, one of the changes they're talking about is changing the reimbursement for biologics, which are right now currently average sale price plus six, and they're talking about changing that to plus three or plus two point something. And this is the price that physicians get reimbursed, because uh, most of these products are physician or hospital administered products. And the thing about this issue is that most physicians, particularly in rural, rural parts of the uh, country, and I'm sure that's the case here in Wisconsin, um, have a hard time even paying for a product at ASP plus six. So if you start um, giving less of a reimbursement, uh, most of the innovative products get reimbursed this way. Physicians are going to be paying out of pocket for them, which means they're likely, likely to um, make different pre treatment choices for their patients, which is not anything that any of us um, want to see. Um, uh, on the um, 
you know, we were just talking also on the state side, we're not immune from this um, either. Um, right now we're working to implement um, the Affordable Care Act across the states and one of the things that bio is focused on is to ensure that innovative medicines get covered um, as essential health benefits are being set up and the exchanges are being created. Um, Brian and Jordan and I were talking earlier that Wisconsin has um, opted into um, the federal, ex you know, to do a federal exchange, not have a state-run exchange. Uh, the state where I live, Pennsylvania, on Tuesday announced that it also was going to opt into the federal exchange, which I think made it the 28th state um, to opt into a federal exchange rather than uh, create their own exchange, which is a, was totally unintended when the uh, health care law was created. I think there was an expectation that states would run these themselves. So the interesting thing is going to be, does the federal government have the resources to do this? Um, it wasn't what was intended. And it'll be interesting to see now, with that bulk purchasing power, what the federal government does about covering innovative products um, with so many exchanges in one big exchange. So um, we thought we were going to be fighting this in 50 states. It looks like um, a lot of it's going to be federally focused, but we'll also uh, be working in the states that are going to be creating their own exchange. And finally, one of the very positive things that the um, Affordable Care Act did is it created a pathway for the development of biosimilars, which heretofore had not been created. So you can get bioproduct, biosimilar products on the market um, now uh, once the FDA develops a, an approval process for those. And um, with this, our industry received 12 years of exclusivity for innovative products, which is something which is very important to us and to our patents to ensure. So, this was a win-win. It provided patients access long-term to hopefully longer, lower-cost biologics, and in the short term, provided um, a big win for innovators. So a very positive thing. But now, um, the federal law has been upheld by the Supreme Court. Uh, we're going to be focusing in all 50 states. Um, uh, pharmacy practice acts in states govern how products get substituted, and uh, biosimilars was not contemplated um, when those acts were were created, so now we're going to be updating the laws in all 50 states, and it's going to be uh, a very heavy lift for us around the country um, over the next two years. Um, like I said at the beginning, you, you know better than anyone in Wisconsin uh, what the election cycle's been like and how um, consensus uh, can change rather rapidly. Um, so uh, the, the answer now is sort of what next, and uh, where are, is bio going from here? Where are we going to be working with our state affiliates? Um, frankly, we're playing defensive in the lame duck session between now and Christmas or the new year, whenever they decide they're going to deal with these issues. Um, and it's uh, all hands on deck right now in Washington, D.C. Um, we're really working to fully fund the FDA and restore NIH cuts. Um, for us, uh, sequestration would be a bad thing as an industry if, if those things happen. And then over the long term, you know, our two long term focuses are on tax policy. We really believe that there will be comprehensive tax reform in the next Congress. And so one of the things we're focusing on, what does that tax reform look like, particularly for smaller, innovative, um, device, diagnostic, biotech, pharmaceutical companies? And what can we do to create a positive climate to ensure um, that investors keep investing in those climates? So we're looking at some things like passive loss and a patent box and some creative ways that we can um, help investors um, through tax policy keep investing in our industry. And um, we have a couple bills that we're going to be introducing in the new Congress. Um, we already have some bipartisan support for them. Um, so it'll be you know, a very important conversation. And then um, at the direction of our board, um, BIO over the next two years is going to be developing a comprehensive clinical trials modernization plan. Um, because one of the things we're seeing in our industry is the tremendous escalating cost of clinical trials. It's getting harder to enroll patients. And really, the FDA needs to modernize, and they know they need to modernize. So BIO is, is going to be working with groups all across the country, um, patient advocacy organizations, other trade associations, our state associations, to try and put a plan together with the FDA on how we can really help to modernize that process. And that's sort of our next big um, thinking project. Um, so this is the part where I pull out my crystal ball. I think you know one of the questions we'll probably get in question and answer is what's going to happen. And I can tell you, yesterday we had a uh, patient, our first annual uh, patient advocacy summit in Washington, D.C. We had about 90 patient advocacy groups around the country. And one of the panels we had was a very thoughtful panel. Um, one of the leaders, staff leaders from the House of Re Representatives on the, um, on the Ways and Means Committee, and one of the staff leaders uh, in the Senate on the Senate Finance Committee. 
uh, one of the preeminent Washington lobbyists and um, um, our uh, head of federal government affairs. At the end, uh, the moderator asked the question, one word, you know, what do you think is going to happen from each of them in, in terms of the next three or four weeks? Uh, it was a fascinating answer. Um, two of them thought we were going to go over the fiscal cliff, and two of them thought we were going to get a deal. Um, so that goes to show you that even the experts in Washington don't really know what the two, next two or three weeks are going to hold. Um, and uh, you know, there's some speculation that the cliff might be a slope, and we'll go over it, but the Congress will come back, and the first Congress thing the Congress will do, we'll, we'll have a deal in the new Congress. Um, you know, there's some speculation the deal will happen now. Um, you know, there's lots of speculation about what the financial markets will do if and when uh, we do go over that cliff and, um, you know, how some of the things we talked about here uh, might be impacted with that. So, um, as our trade, as your trade association, we're working very hard in Washington um, to ensure that we're, we're fighting every day to make sure that our industry gets protected as much as possible. Um, you know, one of the things that Brian mentioned is we do do our legislative fly-in. Um, this is a tremendous opportunity, and I'll, I'll um, I'll do an ad for a minute. This is a tremendous opportunity for you to come to Washington and meet with your elected officials. I can't tell you the impact that it has. Um, I can go to the Hill every day, but when I go to the Hill with one of you from Wisconsin who creates jobs in the state, who's investing money in the state, who's employing people in the state, it really makes a tremendous difference to the policymakers. And um, so I encourage as many of you as possible to join us. It's a great day and a half. You get a much better policy presentation than this from some more important experts than myself. And um, you get to learn a lot, but you also get to meet with um, other people from around the country um, who are in this industry and also get to meet with probably almost every one of your uh, state elected officials in Washington. So I certainly encourage everyone to attend. Um, and just last but not least, I usually throw this slide in because people forget about state priorities and state priorities are sometimes just as not more important than the federal priorities because a lot of the state times the states are doing the creative things that are really incentivizing um, the industry. You know, I already uh, complimented um, what you're all doing with BioForward here because a lot of these things uh, you're already tackling, um, but these are some of the important things that we're working on in states across the country to ensure that our companies get funded, there's access to capital, there's a great tax policy, uh, there's a right workforce um, development being created around the states. And the places like this, um, tremendous resources get built and people um, develop new ideas here that will be our next, um, hopefully, uh, products. So that's sort of what, um, in a nutshell, that's the naughty and the nice. Um, I hope I'm not too much of a Scrooge. I think there's some wonderful things going on in our industry. I've been blessed to work in it for over 15 years. And um, uh, I think um, it, it, there's just great, tremendous opportunity. I think we're. We're in for a couple road bumps over the next six months, though. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. I know that I'm standing between you and a cocktail, so I'm guessing you all might flee. Um, but I'm certainly happy to take any questions. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I certainly enjoyed my time in Wisconsin. And uh, I hope you'll invite me back at some point in time. Thank you. Well, with that, we are going to adjourn to the cocktail hour. So uh, Fritz is going to be here for a while, so uh, please, uh, please feel free to talk to him. And um, uh, the uh, reception is open. Um, Brian, are we, we good to go? He's checking. But, <laughs> but thanks very much for coming tonight. Uh, look forward to talking to you at the reception. And, and uh, thanks again. Uh, we look forward to your participation this coming year. So thank you. <laughs>